Hello and welcome to this online lecture on um, the British um, Empire, the second British Empire. You have already studied the first British Empire um, of the 18th century and now we're going to move on and look at uh, the nature of British Empire in the 19th um, century with a couple of examples. Also, this is just a, a gentle introduction to the uh, British Empire in Asia and Africa, something you'll cover in greater detail. Um, next year, but we are shifting away from the Atlantic Empire, the Caribbean and North America. They are still there, but they are less important, you know by this stage, that slavery has been abolished and there is maybe less money uh, and wealth to be made from the Caribbean than had been the case. So attention is now being shifted to other parts of, of the world. Now, at a first um, glance, or first appearance, there may be similarities, so it may look like there are similarities between the first British Empire and the second um, British Empire in Asia um, and Africa, um, because ultimately they are both about establishing uh, trading um, opportunities. But the second British Empire is um, more, compli uh, more complicated. It's um, a more nuanced, or more nuanced reasons as to why um, Britain um, decides to acquire territories and have influence over um, parts of the world. Um, in Asia and, and Africa. Now, I guess the best place to start is with a, a little source, and this source is from the um, historian uh, David Canadine. So this is obviously a secondary source, but within his um, within his um, section on the, the British Empire, he includes uh, primary sources. And if you click on the link here, uh, you will see. Uh, sorry, click on the image, you will see some of these primary source. Um, statements by those who were very much part of the Second um, British um, Empire. And here we get um, a kind of a variation of what empire was like in the Caribbean because when Africans were taken from um, the west coast of Africa to Jamaica or Barbados, they were really there as property, property who would labour with the intention of producing goods or a commodity like sugar to be exported to the motherland. They really were not there with the intention of becoming British subjects, were not really there even to be considered as, as humans that could live um, a kind of fruitful life. Perhaps the only interaction that they had with British society or British culture, other than the kind of violent element of it, would be through Bible readings that would be perhaps enforced upon them on a, on a Sunday, if they had a, a, a slave master who was willing to um, uh, give them the opportunity to, to listen to stories from the Bible. So, that um, that's going to change with this, this new empire. There is a view that there are now going to be um, subjects. I'm going to um, point this out by quoting uh, Thomas Munro, who you can read in this um, left-hand side here of um, the Canadian extract. Munro, who was governor um, of Madras territory between 1820 and 1827, believed... Um, the following. He says we should look upon India not as a temporary possession but um, as one which is to be maintained permanently until the natives shall in some future age have abandoned most of their superstitions and prejudices and become sufficiently enlightened to frame a regular government for themselves. So you get this racist view, this idea that Britain is civilised and British people are civilised, there's this cultural superiority and Britain is going to take to India, not just trade but values and um, British culture. And th these um, natives, if you like, are going to be, may not thank you there and there, but they're going to be in the long term be thankful for this British intrusion um, in, their, in their lives because they're going to become more educated, more rational, and be able to form um, proper types of, of governance. This view is then um, expanded upon as you read further down the page. Um, the governor of Bombay, uh, Mount Stuart Elphinstone, um, from 1819 to 1824, um, says something um, similar. He says, if there, um, if there be a wish to contribute to the abolition of the horrors of self-immolation, that's self-hurting yourself, and of infanticide, which the British believe is something that went on within India, um, and ultimately to the um, destruction of superstition in India, so that term being used again, it is scarcely necessary now to prove that the only means of success um, to achieve these goals is to lie in the, the diffusion of knowledge. So again, you get this idea of, kind of British enlightenment, British knowledge, British education being imposed upon Indians 
would have a positive outcome. Um, this is what you might um, call modernization, westernization, imposing things like a tax system, a judicial system, um, all of these things. And um, that's, that's what kind of makes this empire different than the empire that had existed in um, the Caribbean. Um, however, our focus today actually isn't going to be so much on the kind of cultural um, imposition um, on, on Indian um, inhabitants or other parts of, of Asia and Africa. Um, the focus is still going to be on trade, but how trade was perhaps viewed differently in the 19th century than it had been in the um, 18th century and, and, and earlier. So, um, let's um, let's move on and, and kind of think about what, what, what point we're really trying to get at um, here. The British Empire <coughs> is, um, I guess to some extent, um, wounded by the loss of the 13 colonies in North America. And therefore, as a consequence, the views and attitudes towards empire start to change, especially once slavery, um, uh, first of all, the slave trade is abolished and then slavery is abolished from 1833. Um, onwards. The British start to think that they are above empire, that they are superior to the concept of empire and that formal empire is now going to be um, something of the past and because Britain by the 1830s has underwent this massive industrial revolution, Britain doesn't need to engage in mercantilism, it doesn't have to trade in such a way that goods have to flow through the motherland before they can go anywhere else. Britain wants to engage in free trade and free trade um, will be beneficial to Britain. So yes, other countries um, are going to have to accept British goods and Britain will have to accept that she should have open doors for goods to come into her country. But the benefits, it was believed, would outweigh any kind of um, negatives because of the power and the force of British industrialisation at this point. And Britain also had a navy that could ship these goods all over the world. So mercantilism was dead. That's um, the view of the, the British at this point. Empire itself is an outdated concept, right? Empires were now deemed to be corrupt and autocratic, as was the case in China, or the Ottoman Empire, or the Russian Empire. And the British state, which was really starting to take hold from the 1830s onwards, was going to be a state which was based upon efficient, rational uh, ways of doing things, a minimalist state where possible. This you have already seen with your study of the Irish famine where the policy or ideology of laissez-faire meant that there was very little um, or limited government intervention in trying to address the problems of the Irish people during the, the famine. Now, there is a problem with this idea that Britain between, let's say, 1840 and 1880 goes down a route of not wanting empire, that Britain does not want territories and colonies because um, 19th century Britain is very much seen as being a period of territorial expansion. So the historian Carol Hack, in this final quotation, um, sums up the problem right of this period, and that is, uh, he says, we are left with a perplexing paradox. Political and economic thinking within Britain was moving towards freer trade, and that included a strong strand of scepticism towards territorial empire. Right, so the ideas of empire are no longer in vogue. However, during this period, Britain continued to add more and more territory to its empire. That, that doesn't make sense, right? Why would Britain be going down one particular pathway ideologically, but then doing something completely different um, in, in reality? And that's really the story um, that we want to focus on. The evidence um, of this can be seen um, with this little map here, where you can see that Britain makes um, quite um, significant acquis um, acquisitions, territorial acquisitions, in, in parts of Africa, parts of Asia, um, during um, this period of um, the kind of 1830s through the 1880s. In fact, the date given here is from 1839 uh, to 1886. Territory is added, right? There's 15.3 million square kilometers added to the empire in the kind of middle period of the 19th century. The population of Britain increases by 6 million during this um, time frame, but it increases um, by much um, greater number in the empire, 189 million to 271 million people living under lands or territories that have now been conquered by the British and are now being run by the British. So acquiring territories um, to kind of the guarantee markets was really part of the mercan uh, mercantilist um, system, mercantilism that we've spoke about that you've already studied. So mercantilism is dead. Free trade is alive and well, free trade is the mantra of the future, 
But the paradox is, why does Britain keep taking territories when she is claiming to be in favour of free trade? Why would you want to settle land, settle territories, impose culture, impose values if your main um, kind of um, approach or your main kind of um, aim is purely to um, enhance and increase trade. So, to understand why this paradox, if you like, um, uh, occurs, why it exists, we have to study what we call the imperialism of free trade. This is a, a theory um, that we associate with the historians Gallagher and Robinson. It's quite an old theory, right? We're now talking about um, 70 years old, but the sign of a good historical interpretation is that if lots of people try and evaluate it and question it, and it stands the test of time. Uh, and that might be the case with Gallagher and Robinson's theory, although there are some examples you're going to look at later on that will allow you to evaluate this. Now, a big part of today's story is going to be about China and the Opium Wars within China and you're going to look at the Opium Wars to basically test this idea that there was such a thing as the imperialism of free trade. So we need to start off by establishing what we mean by the imperialism of free trade. So the argument goes that Britain, as you are aware, had a formal empire mostly in the Caribbean, North America, Canada a little bit of India, up until 1840. That was formal empire based on mercantilism. Right? Mercantilism after the 1840s is then seen to be outdated and it, it completely disappears. It already um, started to um, crumble. But 1849, the navigation acts are, are gone once and for all. Then we get this period known as informal empire between 1840 and 1880, where it appears that Britain is much more interested in free trade with countries. And then, post-1880, you see Britain return to formal trade. And here, a sort of formal empire with a trade that would be beneficial to the motherland. So you can always get a, not quite a return to mercantilism, but something that appears to be based around the idea that Britain will look out for itself first and its colonies are there to serve Britain. Um, so this little period in the middle, is that an anomaly? Why does Britain drift back towards more formal empire? Right, we'll get to that point. The argument that is put forth by Gallagher and Robinson is that informal empire Although there was this desire and demand, first and foremost, for free trade, if necessary, the view of the British government, the desire, if you like, of British merchants as well was, take territories if need be. If it's going to help and benefit Britain, then let's take territories. So, informal empire was never truly informal empire. It was basically a question of whatever works, works, whatever leads to more opportunities for business and commerce, then so be it. Whatever leads to more profit, then that's what will, will happen. Now, there are sources here, right, that normally I would ask you to look at in class and answer um, these uh, questions in A, B, and C. Um, I'll show you the sources, um, A, B, C, D, E. Um, I'll show you the sources um, here. Um, now, rather than me, um, rather than me kind of ask you to pause and go away and do that, uh, go and do this task, I'm just going to read through um, some of the kind of key points, right, of Gallagher and Robinson's theory. It's quite tough theory actually, kind of get your head around completely, but I'm just going to um, stick to, to the basics, right? The, the argument historically went, before Gallagher and Robinson intervened in this topic, the argument went that um, basically um, there was, um, in the period 1840-1880, less desire for empire, and that's because of the things that we've spoken about, this kind of view that Britain was now um, a, an economy based on less of fair doctrine limited intervention and um, that view um, you know did exist you know right up until 1950s when Gallagher and Robinson um, write and the argument I guess of these previous historians who take that view um, may be summarized in section 6 where it says um, the mid-Victorian formal formal empire did not expand so goes the argument and did it seem to be disintegrating therefore the period was anti-imperialist, the later Victorian formal empire, so that's post-1880, um, expanded rapidly. Therefore, this was an era of imperialism. The change was caused by the obsolescence of, of free trade. So, after 1880, free trade disappeared and Britain went back to something that resembled mercantilism. Now, that argument is fine if there was no um, evidence that might challenge it, but there is evidence that challenges it, and that's really what point seven and 8 say. And point seven and 8 basically say, 
There's lots of territories that Britain acquires during the period 1840 to 1880. In fact, Gallic and Robinson say, we'll rhyme them off, right? And rhyme them off, they do. Um, so Britain occupies New Zealand, the Gold Coast of Africa, Wuhan, Natal, um, that's um, a territory we'll come back to in a second, the Punjab in India, Sindh in Hong Kong, Sindh in India, Hong Kong, obviously, you know what that is. Ud is in uh, northern India, Burma, uh, nowadays Myanmar, uh, Kowloon in China, Lagos in Nigeria, Sierra Leone, uh, which is on the west coast of Africa, Basutoland and Griqualand and Transvaal, all in southern Africa. Um, and then new colonies in Queensland and Australia and British Columbia and Canada. All of these territories come under British rule and British control at a point when Britain is not mainly interested in the formal empire. So how uh, do Gallagher and, and Robinson ex explain this, right? How do they kind of um, come to this um, opinion where they say, yeah, you might argue that there was a desire for free trade, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's always the way that things worked out. Hence why they call their theory the imperialism of free trade. It's still imperialism, it's imperialism with free trade. I guess in that respect it does seem quite simple to kind of comprehend. So, if required, Britain took territories. And South Africa is a good example of this, right? Um, this is kind of explained quite well up in the top paragraph that you can read through um, in your own time. But you'll see that the, the, the Gladstone government, right, of the kind of period of the 1840s and 1880s, which was deemed to be kind of anti-imperialist, annexed territories in Basutoland, Greek, uh, Griqualand West, um, in order to ensure the safety of pre-existing acquisitions that Britain had in Southern Africa, right? So here um, is a couple of oh, um, examples, right, um, that I want to focus on. Um, maps are obviously a good way to, to kind of do this. Um, okay, let's go back one second. Um, so, what we um, what we see is that in the southern states of um, which were territories of well, eventually become South Africa, um, all of this territory that's covered pink, right, is um, British, right, and you can see some of the names I've just mentioned there, such as um, Basuto Land, um, Zulu Land as well would become part of um, Britain. Uh, the Cape was was British, and then further. Um, inland, Transvaal becomes um, part of, of Britain as well. Um, when you look at the dates here, right, some of them are obviously in our um, period, but some of them come before um, the period of the 1880s, suggesting obviously that they are annexed or they become territories during this period when free trade was meant to be the dominant, the dominant force, right? So, the argument that Gallagher and Robinson put forward is because of the, the Dutch interest in this part of the world and then eventually the German interest in this part of the world, Britain had to um, ensure that she protected her trading routes to India. So the reason that Britain takes Natal, right, that area here, why she eventually takes the, the Cape, why she has these territories, is not necessarily because she wants to um, colonise this part of South Africa, doesn't necessarily want to send over British settlers and British values and British way of life and British religion. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but that's not her priority. She wants to accumulate territories down here along the coast so as to protect British shipping and to have friendly British ports before British ships then went further east to um, India and then further again to Britain's um, Far East Asian colonies. And that's the story of China that we'll get to. So, um, imperialism, acquisition of territories would take place if it benefited free trade, is a point that Gallagher and Robinson um, tried to, to make. Now, the actual uh, concept of free trade, or the imperialism of free trade, can be applied to one particular event in history, and that event is known as the Opium Wars, and it's a um, a story that we're going to look at right now. There's two opium wars, we're only going to focus on the first one of um, 1839. Britain had um, got itself into quite a, a good position in terms of her relations with China in that she um, found a, a commodity that the Chinese wanted and as a result of this could make lots of money. China had something that Britain wanted, tea, and Britain could therefore take this tea from China and therefore um, merchants could make lots of money sending this back to the motherland. So there's good, good business opportunities within um, within China. 
Um, China um, has not been colonised by foreign powers. It is very much an independent um, state. And what I'm going to think, or what, what you think about here is, can you apply this concept of the imperialism of free trade, this idea that you don't actually have to settle places to um, be um, an empire, to be pro-imperialism. You just might take certain territories or areas to enhance your trading um, opportunities. Now, if China had, this is a bit, very much the British view, if China had played the game and hadn't interfered in British free trade, then Britain may not have acquired territories from China. But as soon as Britain tries to, sorry, as soon as China tries to restrict British free trade, then that's a different ballgame altogether. Then the British may have to say, well, do you know what, China, if you don't play by our rules, then we are going to have to impose uh, some type of um, sanction upon you, and that sanction may be war and territorial um, acquisition. So, basically, to give you a, a really quick summary, right, but you may watch a little video clip on this anyway, or you can listen to a podcast on it as well. Um, very quick summary of what happens. Um, open wars are really are very much about trade, first and foremost. But there are some um, alternative sources that you can examine that might challenge that. But anyway, Britain likes tea, so China sends tea to Britain. Uh, China doesn't like anything from Britain, right? It's not interested in any British goods or commodities. So what Britain has to give China back is silver. Britain's silver starts to deplete, and therefore the British have to come up with a way of how can they get tea out of China without giving away our um, silver deposits. What the Chinese do like, or what the Chinese do like in some areas, and that area is in Canton, right, in the area of Hong Kong in particular, but also in, down to Shanghai, what the, the, the Chinese do like is, is opium. And not just um, opium for medicinal purposes, right, you will know yourself that William Wilberforce did use a little bit of opium in a drug that was called laudanum, which helped him with his stomach pains. We're not talking about medicinal opium here, we're talking about opium to um, get high, to enjoy. Um, and also this was a very dangerous uh, way of enjoying yourself because it led to a zombie-like um, population in parts of China who were constantly loaded on, on opium. So what kind of stopped the British from having to give away all their silver was that they would give the Chinese um, um, opium and also the Chinese would give the British tea in return but it went beyond that because opium would outsupply tea and then silver started to make its way back to Britain. So actually trade in opium became very useful for Britain. Where did this opium come from? It came from the, the poppy fields in northern India, which to this day kind of bother on with, um, um, I guess, um, Afghanistan. So Britain has control of um, opium and it's got control now of um, trade with China in this instance. Now, there is a key difference, isn't there, between um, tea and opium, and I've already mentioned it. The difference is tea does not do any social damage, right? There are no real uh, pitfalls of having tea, um, lots of tea um, being consumed within your um, population. But opium is a different matter. And the consumption of opium was a, a major problem for the Chinese. And the Chinese emperor eventually had enough and he asked uh, one of his um, kind of um, advisors, uh, Lin Zhizhou, to um, address this problem. And that is why we get um, the, the Opium Wars. Because the British are appalled by the response of the Chinese, and the response of the Chinese is to take um, opium and dump it in the sea, and to lock some of it up, and to even lock up some of the British um, traders, many of whom actually came from Scotland. And um, the British thought this is this is an outrage, this is an attack on British um, British free trade, and therefore the British basically declare war. And what's interesting here is that the British um, military, the British navy, are supporting and defending British merchants. Merchants have the support of um, the British military. So the Opium Wars take place. Britain wins the Opium Wars fairly easily because um, she has superior navy by some way um, over the Chinese. The outcome of the war is that Britain takes territories. They take territories um, as part of what we call the Treaty of Nanking, which the Chinese to this day find to be incredibly humiliating treaties. Um, and one of the kind of key prizes that the British took 
was Hong Kong. You can just see it on the map here, and you know that Hong Kong currently has some problems and issues. Those problems can be traced back to British rule. So really, as soon as the British took um, Hong Kong in 1842, it was the beginning really of the, the long-term, I guess, reasons as to why there are problems in, in, in that part of the world um, today. Because Hong Kong people to this day, these Cantonese people, um, are less tied to the Chinese state and Chinese mainland because they've always seen themselves as being a bit more freer and independent because of their British, and if you have to call it British heritage. Um, the reason why Britain takes Hong Kong and these other um, territories up the coast of China is because they're now, these territories are going to be useful for, for, for Britain when it comes to trade. Britain has got no real interest in settling these areas. She does eventually kind of, in inverted commas, settle Hong Kong. But what we get in Hong Kong are really just um, administrators who go there and um, officials. It's not a place where the British population are going to migrate there to, to kind of live, right? It's still very much um, a Chinese uh, population within um, Hong Kong. Um, the sources here you can click on if you want are just um, sources that come from British newspapers in the period that maybe suggest that Britain didn't go to war purely for trade reasons that the, the, the Opium Wars was more about status, it was that Britain couldn't see herself backing down to um, what they argued was an inferior nation, right, the Chinese. Um, so that, that's part of it. The other argument and the other source says that, you know, British women and children were um, abused by the Chinese and Britain um, had to, you know, stand by the honour of these women and therefore um, had to had to go to war. So you get these kind of other um, arguments, and some of them are genuine arguments, right? They're spoken about in, in Parliament, in fact, in the source here. You get the parliamentary debate about um, why Britain should go to war with China um, uh, in 1839. So there are counter-arguments, but the main argument, I think the main factor that seems to have the most evidence supporting it is the view that Britain goes to war purely for trade reasons. And it ties in with Gallic and Robinson's theory. Ideally, trade with opium could have carried on without any territorial acquisitions whatsoever. That would have been free trade. But as soon as the Chinese throw a spanner in the works, i.e. they put obstacles in front of British opium trading, then we get the imperialism of free trade. Britain goes to war, takes territories, and then free trade um, can, can continue. What I want you to do, obviously, to kind of get your head around this, is in your own time um, go into my city and watch this way presentation uh, and here you've got a little video clip um, that you can you can um, watch and answer the questions you then have um, on my city the other um, example of um, British Empire during this period which is Britain's involvement in India and there is only one chapter on my city and it covers the Indian example whereas this way it covers um, the Chinese example and these are areas that could be assessed in some shape or form in your, um, in your exam in, in January. Okay, that's all for now. Thank you.